clients' concerns. And so you're going to hear a story tonight. You're going to hear the faces that we ought to be concerned about. Well, you're going to hear about uh, Fred Korematsu and uh, his colleagues and friends and family members. Uh, and I think you're going to be really pleased to, to hear this story. Um, we've been talking about restorative justice, reparative justice, and given what's going on in the world today after what happened last week at the Capitol and, and what's been happening since November's election, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about cancel culture. Well, you know, it happened a long time ago or it really didn't happen that way or we really don't have to deal with it in our textbooks. Our history really uh, doesn't really need to touch on this. Let's focus on the positive. Let's not have difficult conversations. Well, uh, this in is better than that. Our leadership has known that we are better than that. And so we are going to have a difficult conversation and not just one. We're gonna to continue to have difficult conversations throughout the evening and throughout the year. A couple of sort of announcements. One is that we typically do not record these sessions and tonight is going to be a slight exception. We're going to record uh, our guest speaker's presentation in the Q&A, but then we're going to turn off the recording. So for those of you that are shy or um, just don't want to ask your question and have it recorded, don't worry. Um, hold on to that thought and when we stop the recording, you can give us your candid conversations or uh, questions at that time. But we are going to record it because the presentation is going to be used in other contexts and so we've agreed that we would allow that and then when the presentation ends and the Q&A is over, we'll stop the recording. So uh, there you have that. After the guest speaker and after the Q&A, we're gonna maybe hear from our skeptical team and we're also going to hear from other team members on team four to talk about some of these issues and um, add some more twists and turns to this very complex and complicated subject. Um, a word about our guest speaker. It's my great pleasure to introduce Don Tamaki. He's from San Francisco and is, um, a mentor of mine and just a wonderful lawyer and a wonderful person. What I'll tell you, you should look him up because you know he's a Phi Beta Kappa and he's got you know a bazillion awards and wonderful degrees and he's worked on the travel ban case, Trump versus Hawaii. A recent note, you're going to hear about his work in Korematsu. He is uh, one of the lawyers that represented the California State Bar, urging the Supreme Court of that state to admit someone who was undocumented and he was successful in that effort. You're, you're gonna hear, you can look him up and learn more about him. But what I want you to know about Don Tamaki is that he's the kind of lawyer you wanna co-counsel with. He's the kind of lawyer you want to have as opposing counsel. He's the kind of lawyer that judges long to have in their courtrooms. He's the kind of lawyer that every good lawyer wants to emulate. You'll see why in just a minute, and it's now my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for the evening, Mr. Don Tamaki. Well, thank you, Judge Livingston. I asked her to uh, keep the introduction as short as possible, and obviously my, uh, my motion was denied. But uh, thank you so much, uh, Judge Livingston. It's a real thrill for me to do this presentation, so I want to thank the leadership of Inn of Court. I want to commend you for taking on difficult topics like the theme of racism and reparations. I'm going to talk about that, um, but using the vehicle of the Korematsu case. And as I swing through that, um, give you five minutes of my comments about uh, why reparations uh, is appropriate um, in a number of contexts. So let's, let's begin. Um, I don't have to tell you that we are living at a time when demagoguery is surging. It's happening in America, but demagogues worldwide have used the same playbook since time immemorial. What is that playbook? One, appeal to prejudice. Two, fear monger and scapegoat. And three, engage in conspiracy theories and alternative facts. When demagoguery and conspiracy theories take root and alternative facts hold sway over the real ones, History tells us that society can descend into a very dark place when neither the law matters, the constitution matters, nor um, uh, principles. To this point, literally millions now believe that the presidential election was stolen. Despite the utter lack of any evidence of fraud, 
that would have made any difference in the outcome. 147 House and Senate members have pandered to this fantasy by voting to overturn the election. As a direct result, the Capitol was defiled, five people died, 25,000 troops have been deployed to protect the peaceful transfer of power, and state houses from Austin to Lansing have been hardened against potential attack. Of the hundreds of thousands of deaths that have occurred due to COVID, many were preventable and the result of willful denial of facts and science. The enabling of demagoguery may be the greatest threat to American democracy in modern times. How did we get here? Well, we can learn a lot from history. The rounding up of almost 120,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry, 70,000 who were American citizens by birth also occurred at a time when neither the facts nor the constitution mattered. Korematsu versus the United States is really a case study of what happens when systemic racism normalizes a culture of prejudice such that demonization, falsehoods, and injustice seem perfectly normal, perfectly just, logical, nat natural, and reasonable. What was the crime of Japanese Americans? They happened to look like the enemy. General John L. DeWitt concluded that their race made Japanese Americans inherently disloyal, concluding, quote, the Japanese race is an enemy race. The very fact that no sabotage has taken place is a disturbing and confirming indication that such action will be taken, unquote. How, how's that for a conspiracy theory? The very fact that you've never committed a crime is a disturbing and confirming indication that you will commit a crime. QAnon has nothing on General DeWitt. Korematsu is now regarded as one of the worst decisions in the history of the Supreme Court, right up there with Dred Scott and Plessy versus Ferguson. What most people don't know, however, is that Korematsu is also the result of a scandal of epic proportions. In the 1980s, I served on the pro bono legal team representing Fred Korematsu in reopening his landmark 1944 US Supreme Court case, upholding the constitutionality of the mass roundup despite the absence of charges, trial, evidence, or wrongdoing. Our reopening was based on secret Justice Department, Navy, FBI, and FCC reports that surfaced 37 years later, admitting that Japanese Americans had committed no wrong and had posed no threat. Other Justice Department memoranda characterized the Army's claims that Japanese Americans were spying as, quote, intentional falsehoods. These official re reports were never presented to the Supreme Court, having been intentionally suppressed, altered, and destroyed pursuant to the orders of high officials in order to manipulate the outcome of the Korematsu decision. Let me frame the chronology of events. On December 7, 1941, within hours of Japan's attack, agents swept through Japanese American community, communities up and down the West Coast, arresting their leaders. On February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, empowering the military to designate military areas from which any person could be excluded. The very next day, the eight most Western states were put under the authority of General John L. DeWitt. On March 2nd, 1942, DeWitt issued Public Proclamation 1, designating all of California and the Western halves of Oregon, Washington, and the Southern half of Arizona as military area one. On March 21, President Roosevelt signed Public Law 503, stating, quote, whoever shall enter, remain in, leave, or commit any act in any military zone shall be guilty and upon conviction shall be liable to a fine or imprisonment or both. So imagine the room you are seated in right now is military area one, could be California, 
Oregon, Washington, or in Arizona, and you are Japanese American. Well, you know you can't enter this room, but that's too late. The room has been your home for years. So you'll think you'll remain. Well, it's a crime for you to do that. So you decide to leave. Oops, that's also a crime. On March 27, 1942, DeWitt issued an order making it a crime that for Japanese Americans to leave military area one. And on May 3rd, DeWitt issued another order making it a crime for Japanese Americans to leave. Public law 503 presented Japanese Americans with diametrically contradictory orders, which simultaneously made them criminals if they left their homes or if they didn't leave. Obedience to one part of public law 503 would necessarily violate the other. The only way that Japanese Americans could avoid criminal prosecution was to submit at gunpoint to indeterminate confinement in detention camps, abandoning their property, their businesses, and taking only that which they could carry. When Bay Area Japanese Americans were ordered out of their homes, my father was about to graduate from the University of California at Berkeley with a degree in pharmacy. But because he had been taken away, Berkeley scrolled up his diploma in a tube and mailed it to him. And I wonder, Chase, if you could put up slide one. The remarkable thing about the slide is not the diploma. Although going to Berkeley was quite an achievement for someone who grew up poor in San Francisco, Japantown, and during the period of the country's ultra systemic racism against Asian immigrants. The remarkable thing about the photo is the address on the mailing tube. Do you know what Tanforan Assembly Center Barrack 80 Apartment 5 was? It was a horse stall. The government surrounded Tanforan Racetrack in San Bruno, just south of San Francisco, with barbed wire and machine gun towers, and forced about 7,800 of these Americans out of their homes, while 10 more permanent American style concentration camps were being built from California to Arkansas. Metaphorically speaking for my father, this diploma was the promise of America. But the mailing tube encircling and constraining that promise addressed to a horse stall reeking of manure was his reality. I keep this memento because it reminds me of how far we've come. Chase, I wonder if you could take that down for me. Fred Korematsu was also required by Public Law 503 to turn himself in at Tanforam, but he refused. Alienated from his parents, in love with an Italian American girl, and regarding himself as 100% American being born in Oakland, California, Fred decided to evade the law. He tore up his enemy alien registration card which had been issued to all Japanese Americans. He took the name Clyde Sarah and indicative of his desperation, underwent minor plastic surgery to look less Japanese. On May 30th, 1942, while waiting to meet his girlfriend on a street, he was arrested. While held at the army stockade in San Francisco, Fred was visited by Ernest Bessig of the ACLU. At Fred's arraignment, the judge set bail at $2,500, adjusted for inflation, that's about $40,000 today. To Fred's surprise, Bessick took out a checkbook, wrote a check for the bail, gave it to the clerk, and said, come on, Fred. And the two walked towards the courthouse door, only to be stopped by four MPs. Despite the fact that Fred had posted bail, which, which would have allowed any other person to be free, DeWitt's orders prohibited him as a Japanese American from being in military area one. So Fred was taken back to the stockade and thereafter to Tantharan and ultimately incarcerated at Topaz, Utah. Fred wrote to Bessick, quote, these camps are definitely an imprisonment under armed guard with orders to shoot to kill. These people should have been given a fair trial 
in order that they may defend their loyalty at court in a democratic way, unquote. Well, Fred tried to do just that at his trial in September of 1942. He wrote, he testified, quote, as a citizen of the United States, I am ready, willing, and able to bear arms for this country, he said. He testified that he had registered for the draft, tried to volunteer for the Navy, that he had never been to Japan, that he couldn't read Japanese, and that he spoke it poorly. Still, the judge found uh, Fred guilty of violating public law 503, but allowed a military policeman to take him back to camp. Thus, Fred began his lonely battle to reach the Supreme Court, arguing that the mass roundup was unconstitutional. The government defended against Fred's appeal of his conviction on two grounds. First, the army claimed that Japanese Americans were committing acts of espionage in the form of shore to ship radio transmitter, uh, transmitters and signaling. And second, they argued that Japanese Americans were so culturally so linguistically, so racially different as a people that they couldn't be trusted to be loyal. Because not a single Japanese American was ever charged, let alone tried and convicted of espionage or sabotage for the entire duration of the war, the burden fell on DeWitt to issue a final report to prove that what he did was reasonable. There was only one problem. It was entirely made up and the government knew it at the time. When Korematsu reached the Supreme Court in 1944, Solicitor General Charles Fahey repeated DeWitt's claims. But instead of asking questions, the court passively deferred, thereby abdicating its constitutional role as a check and balance on the abuse of power by the executive branch. In a six to three decision, Justice Black wrote that this was not a case of racial hostility against Fred or Japanese Americans. Instead, this was a case of military necessity. But three dissenting justices, justices said that was preposterous. Justice Frank Murphy wrote that the exclusion of Japanese Americans, quote, falls within the ugly abyss of racism. Justice Robert Jackson wrote, the court for all time has validated the principle of transplanting American citizens and of racial discrimination. The principle lies around like a loaded weapon, ready for the hand of any authority who can put forth a plausible claim of an urgent need. 37 years later, Professor Peter Irons, conducting research in order to write a book about Fred, tried to locate the Justice Department files on his case. The archivist said, they're missing. We can't find them. But two weeks later, Peter got a call from this archivist saying, we found them. They were misfiled in the Commerce Department. Peter went to the Commerce Department and found boxes and opened them wrapped with twine that obviously had not been disturbed in decades. With researcher Aiko Yoshinaga Herzeg, they uncovered whistleblower memos written by Edward Ennis, the director of the Department of Justice Enemy Alien Control Division and responsible for supervising the drafting of the government's brief defending the mass roundup. When Ennis began searching for the evidence of Japanese Americans uh, and their commission, commission of espionage, to Ennis's alarm, he found the opposite, that there was no evidence. I'm gonna ask Chase to uh, roll a video in which Ennis was interviewed both in 60 Minutes that covered this case and um, during the course of some other interviews. So Chase, can you roll that? My stepfather got out of law school really in the depths of the depression, clerked for a federal judge, 
and went into the Justice Department. And this was a time, of course, of the Roosevelt administration. And many of the very, very bright and able young people who went into the Justice Department were very much motivated by the ideals of the New Deal. I was in my office on Sunday, December 7, 41, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, and got all of the officials to come into the department that night, where uh, I drafted uh, the orders for the NN control unit of the department. When I first saw DeWitt early in December, I don't think it ever occurred to him that he would be allowed to give a military order which would say that all the states of California and Oregon and Washington were uh, barred to American citizens of Japanese ancestry as well as aliens. He wanted the civilian authorities, the Department of Justice, to intern more Japanese aliens than we were interned. It was our view that really a minimum program was required. The Attorney General and I and the Department of Justice uh, believe there was no factual basis for moving against Americans of Japanese ancestry. This was very largely a movement by a lot of different people to use an opportunity to get the Japanese farmers off the West Coast. Why did they want to get rid of them? Competition? Well, they got all their land. They've, they've got thousands and thousands of the best, of the best farmland in, uh, in California. Edward Ennis was in charge of preparing the government's brief to the Supreme Court when the Korematsu case came before it. So Ennis is looking to confirm and incorporate the facts of DeWitt, that Japanese Americans were engaging in espionage and sabotage. And so he begins to call up these reports thinking that he's going to incorporate this evidence within the government's brief. And in searching for the evidence, he finds the opposite that there is no evidence. Among the documents he found was the Office of Naval Intelligence report. They not only say that Japanese Americans pose no danger, but it actually recommends against this rounding up that happened. He writes to the Solicitor General of the United States, a guy by the name of Charles Fahey. The Solicitor General is the nation's chief representative to the United States Supreme Court. The Solicitor General speaks not just for the President, but also for the Congress of the United States. And Ennis says, it occurs to me that if we don't disclose the contents of the Navy report to the court, that we are engaging in the suppression of evidence. Ennis writes to the FBI Director, J. Edgar Hoover, and basically says, what about these reports by DeWitt of illicit signaling by Japanese Americans. And J. Edgar Hoover writes back, we've investigated every single claim of shorter ship radio transmissions, and we could find no evidence on which prosecution would lie. Ennis got in touch with James Lawrence Fly, who was the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. He prepared reports which they sent to Ennis which concluded that there was no substance to any charge that Japanese Americans had committed acts of espionage or sabotage. We had that investigated by both the Federal Bureau of Investigation and by the Federal Communications Commission. And we got reports that there was no uh, records and their records were complete of any such uh, signaling. Ennis enlists the help of a fellow Justice Department lawyer by the name of John Burling. When the final draft of the government's brief to the Supreme Court in the Korematsu case was being prepared, John Burling decided to insert a footnote. It was a cautionary footnote that said, we are in possession of information that contradicts General DeWitt's final report particularly as it involves the commission of acts of espionage and sabotage by Japanese Americans. 
in this case, the stakes and the consequences were so high. By this time, almost 120,000 Americans had already been deprived of their freedom. They were imprisoned. The Supreme Court briefs are printed in booklets. The brief is actually goes to the printing presses. John J. McCloy found out about the footnote. He contacted Solicitor General Charles Fahey, and Fahey ordered the printing presses stopped. The original footnote that John Burling drafted was deleted. At the oral argument, the Solicitor General absolutely stood behind General DeWitt's report. So this attempt to alert the Supreme Court that this roundup, this mass incarceration, really rested upon a foundation of intentional falsehoods failed. And that case stood for 40 years. you, Chase. You can take that down. So, in short, every intelligence agency having jurisdiction over national security on the West Coast had concluded that Japanese Americans posed no threat and that DeWitt's claims were false. Department of Justice lawyer John Burling wrote to the Assistant Attorney General Herbert Wexler, writing, quote, there is no doubt that DeWitt's uh, statements are, quote, intentional falsehoods. Ennis himself wrote to Wexler, quote, we have an ethical duty to refrain from citing DeWitt's claims if the Department of Justice knows that they are untrue. The tenor of the final report is that overt acts of treason were being committed. Since this is not so, it is highly unfair to this racial minority that these lies go uncorrected, unquote. Nevertheless, the evidence was suppressed and altered, and one crucial document, which undermined the government's position, was even ordered burned. The Solicitor General stood behind DeWitt's final report, even though every intelligence agency had debunked its claims. On this basis, that a fraud in the high court had been committed, our legal team drafted petitions for writs of error, quorum nobis, for Fred and the companion cases of Gordon Hirabayashi and Minoru Yasui. I don't know about you, but when I was in criminal procedure in law school, I probably was asleep when they talked about writs of error quorum nobis. Uh, I had to learn about this. Um, quorum nobis is a criminal writ. It's kind of like habeas corpus, but it, um, it's available after you've, you've served your time. Um, and you and you you punished and it's really to clear your name. Uh, it's rarely used and um, there's no monetary remedy. But the beauty of it it is is that it has no statute of limitations, and it was the only vehicle available to reopen these ancient cases. However, as you're probably thinking, the legal question in 1944 was whether the removal of Fred and Japanese Americans was constitutional. In the 1980s, using the writ of era quorum nobis, the question was different. It was, was Fred Korematsu denied a fair trial because of governmental misconduct? In other words, we can only attack the Korematsu precedent obliquely, but by uncovering the government's misconduct, it also revealed that this landmark decision rests upon a foundation of fabricated claims and fraud. As a result, in 1984, federal district court judge Marilyn Hall Patel tossed out Fred's criminal conviction, ruling that the government's actions were infected with racism and that crucial evidence had been su suppressed. 27 years later, on May 20th, 2011, acting Solicitor General Neil Cotyol agreed with us. And in an unusual move, 
directed the office of the Solicitor General to issue a confession of error. I wonder, Chase, can you put up slide two? Now the print on this is awfully small. So I'm just gonna quote parts of it. Solicitor General Cotyel stated in part, quote, by the time Fred Korematsu reached the Supreme Court, the Solicitor General had learned that the Office of Naval Intelligence found that only a small percentage of Japanese American posed a security threat and they were already in custody. But the Solicitor General did not inform the court of this report despite warnings from the Department of Justice attorneys that failing to alert the court might approximate the suppression of evidence, quote unquote. Nor did he inform the court that key allegations used to justify the internment that Japanese Americans were using radio transmitters to communicate with the enemy had been discredited by the FBI and the FCC. And to make matters worse, he relied on gross generalizations about Japanese Americans such as that they were disloyal and motivated by, quote, racial solidarity. Today, our office takes this history as an important reminder that the special credence of the Solicitor General uh, enjoys before the Supreme Court requires great responsibility and a duty of absolute candor in our representations to the court, unquote. If you could take slide two down, Chase. Thank you. The Korematsu precedent has had a lasting legacy, including as recently as 2018 in the court's 5-4 ruling upholding the Muslim ban in Trump versus Hawaii. But I'm going to close with a few comments about what should be done to correct injustice and why some form of reparative justice, including reparations, is appropriate. In our reopening of Fred's case, the Department of Justice had a real problem defending the government because the damning evidence came from the government's own files. Department of Justice lawyer Victor Stone therefore pursued three defense strategies. One, delay. Two, argue uh, that the court should let bygones be bygones because reopening a 40 year old case would only rip open old wounds borne by Japanese Americans and prevent them from healing. And three, offer Fred a pardon. When Fred objected that a pardon is for people who are guilty and who need to be forgiven, Stone offered up a quote, pardon for innocence, unquote. What the hell is that? <laughs> We responded that it was Fred's position that it was the government that should seek a pardon from him and for Japanese Americans for what it did. The point is that there can be no justice without accountability. To that end, the Japanese American community launched an 18 year organizing effort culminating in the passage of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 providing a presidential apology, a fund to educate the public about the injustice so as not to repeat it, and 20,000 per surviving internees. There were 120,000 who were incarcerated. By the time the legislation passed, about 80, 82,000 were still living, and those who had died received no compensation. compensation. A key strategy of this 18 year journey was to lobby Congress to create a commission charged with holding hearings across the country to take testimony of internees and historians and to render a report which was aptly named personal justice denied. The American public heard for the first time gut wrenching accounts about the suffering that had been wrought the property, businesses, and lives that had been lost. It helped that 14,000 Japanese Americans volunteered out of the camps to serve in the segregated 442nd Regimental Combat Team, fighting for democracy in Europe while their families ironically remained incarcerated at home. 
To this day, the 442nd is the most decorated unit for its size in the history of the Army, including incurring over 800 casualties to save 211 Texans, known as the Lost Battalion, trapped behind German lines. Black leaders supported, strongly, redress and reparations for Japanese Americans and celebrated with us when it passed. But I know that many were also thinking, what about us? Yes, what about African Americans subjected to 300 years of unparalleled and unimaginable suffering under slavery, creating enormous wealth for, the, for others and who fought for democracy in the Civil War and in all of America's wars to follow. When the Confederacy lost, the efforts of Southern states turned to ending Reconstruction before it started and ensuring white supremacy through horrific Jim Crow laws, cultural norms and traditions lasting 100 years more. Never mind that 40 acres and a mule never materialized. For African Americans, where is the accountability? We know that wealth and opportunities are passed from one generation to the next, but so too the impact of poverty, the absence of opportunity, and the emotional trauma often passes from generation to generation. When Judge Livingston was representing poor people, as was I when we were both serving on our Reginald Heber Smith Poverty Law Fellowships, we could see the effects of multi-generational deprivation, which is arguably created a permanent underclass. As an Asian American who benefited greatly from the sacrifices of Martin Luther King, John Lewis, Medgar Evers, and countless others who changed the country, I think it's way past due for America to examine the harm caused by centuries of systemic racism and to take action to ameliorate it, ameliorate its manifestations today. This is a daunting challenge. Here are some of the barriers that advocates of reparations for the black community face. The belief that reparations would mean that Americans who did not commit the injustice would be required to pay for the sins of the past. The belief that reparations takes rights, privileges and benefits from those who are entitled to them and gives them to people perceived as undeserving. The belief that bygones should be bygones, that efforts to examine and shine a light on the injustice of the past only divides the country and that the nation is better off ignorant of its past and indifferent to its consequences. But these challenges are not insurmountable. Japanese Americans who advocated for redress and reparations face some of these same barriers. History teaches us that one of America's gr greatest strengths is its ability to own up to its wrongs and to redress them. In 1942, then California Attorney General Earl Warren became governor of California by running on the slogan, the Japs must go and urging their imprisonment. But in 1954, as Chief Justice in a stunningly redemptive act, he led a unanimous Supreme Court in Brown versus Board of Education to take down one of the legal pillars of white supremacy, the so-called separate but equal doctrine. In his memoirs, Warren expressed his profound regret for his role in the lockup of Japanese Americans. President Lyndon Baines Johnson, at his own political peril, persuaded, cajoled, arm twisted, and cobbled together a legislative majority to pass the groundbreaking Civil Rights Act of 1964. And in 1988, Japanese Americans, a demographically insignificant portion of the population, persuaded the nation that the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 signed by President Ronald Reagan makes the nation stronger by causing it to live up to its constitutional and democratic ideals. Thereby, I think, giving meaning to Dr. King's aspirational words 
yes, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it does bend towards justice. I want to thank the Inn of Court for allowing me to present this to you and happy to hear your questions. Thank you, Don. I think uh, Judge Mangrum is going to handle the Q&A for us, and so I'll turn it over to her. All right. Who, um, who wants to step in and um, who has a question for Dawn today? Uh, Mr. Tamaki, I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. Um, it was so moving and personally so informative. Um, I obviously knew a little bit about what you spoke on, but um, not much. It was such a wonderful, uh, informative presentation. And I had a question for you about um, the last portion of your uh, your presentation, in particular rep reparations. Sorry, I'm hearing some feedback in the background. Um, but I wanted to know uh, what, what do you think um, personally like what is your opinion as far as the procedures um, the like the best procedure going forward for funding reparations and um, you know asking uh, Congress to uh, you know provide reparations for particular groups for instance black persons and um, and how to how to properly um, distribute those like what did we do it uh, was it best the way that we did it in the past, um, um, uh, the reparations that you spoke about, or is there a better procedure for, for doing it in the future? Thank you for the question. L let me first say that um, reparations was highly controversial, even within our own community. And so in many ways, we had to persuade our own community that this was important for the country. Uh, Minori Yasui, the companion case to Fred Korematsu, you know, he, he graduated from the University of Oregon Law School. And when these orders came down from uh, DeWitt, which began with curfew, uh, targeting Japanese Americans, he himself decided to be his own test case, volunteer to violate the law. And um, he got himself arrested intentionally walking into Portland police station. And uh, of course, uh, he was convicted for violating public law 503. And uh, for that act of defiance, he spent almost nine months in solitary confinement before being incarcerated in Wyoming. Um, he himself had said initially on, if reparations were ever to pass, and he said it wouldn't, uh, he would not accept one penny. But men, as well as others, ultimately became its strongest champions. And uh, how did this happen? Um, when advocates first presented it to congressional leaders, and fortunately, Japanese Americans had people in Congress. That was critical. Robert Matsui, uh, Congressman, Daniel Inoue, and Spark Matsunaga of uh, Hawaii. Um, they said, there's no way that reparations can get on the agenda unless you educate the public. So the first step has to be to educate the public about this, why this even happened. And uh, to give you some idea about that, you know, when we broke the story, when we were about to file our petition for Coram Nobis, I was talking to uh, journalists all across the country and getting them to embargo, agree to embargo the story, the story until we filed. And uh, these are educated people. And they said, this happened in America? Wait a minute, isn't this involved Japanese prisoners of war? And I said, no, they were concentration camps in America. These were American citizens, this happened. And so people knew very little about this. And so even among Japanese Americans, they did not know how much their, fam their other families and the communities had suffered. Why? because people never talked about it. I mean, after they let people out of the camps, Japanese Americans had to return to the very communities that exiled them in the first place. So they kept their mouths shut. And um, I talked about my, my dad in this thing, but uh, until we reopened this case and I showed him a sheaf of, of two inches of government documents, each admitting that there was no reason to do this, um, he had no idea 
uh, how badly they got screwed. It, they assumed it was the result of, you know, emotional wartime hysteria and ordinary prejudice, not realizing it culminated at the highest levels of our government as a calculated um, conspiracy uh, to, to manipulate the outcome of a major Supreme Court case. So the short of it is the commission hearings were critical to educate the American public as to why this was important, not just for Japanese Americans, but for the, the country and the history of the country. And so <clears throat> the strategy was first to educate the country uh, to get it on the agenda and on the radar screen. And uh, it got front page, page coverage uh, uh, border to border. Um, and, um, and then at that point, the debate to answer your question was, was what is appropriate? And what's the amount? And some people said it shouldn't be any amount. Some people have said, well, it should be 100,000. We lost millions in today's dollars. And uh, I don't know how it fixed ultimately on 20,000 per survivee. And, and the attorney, the attorneys had, the, the decision was to, to give it uh, to people who are living. So that was a practical cutoff point. But I, I think the, the most important point is that it had some real money behind it. So it memorialized the wrong. And uh, America, you know, you as judges realize that in order to, to have accountability and to have justice on, on the civil side, but it's true in the criminal side too, there has to be some money behind it. Otherwise it doesn't mean anything. Um, and the other part was a funding of a public education fund that continues to produce like the video you've seen uh, was funded through um, Civil Liberties Act grant monies uh, that are made, were made available to educate the public. Um, how uh, reparations for other groups and in particular the black community will be could take any number of forms, including uh, maybe some of the remedies that were uh, available in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, affirmative action, um, the war on poverty, other things that have long since been abandoned and uh, withdrawn. Um, but the point of it is the, the level field is not level. It, the playing field is not level. And I, I think the society, we, have, we as a society have to do something to recognize the wrong, uh, to hold, um, to have accountability and to provide some ameliorative remedies. I'll, I'll, add, I'll add that Carl Gustafson from our team is also going to pick up that thread when we're done with the Q&A. So let's continue with the Q&A, but then uh, you're going to hear from other members of our team uh, more directly on that issue as well. I think next we have a question from a member of our skeptic team, David Gonzalez. Hi, I wanted to pick up on the last part you talked about in referencing affirmative action. And if we're talking about hard subjects, uh, I'll bring up the litigation, um, probably en route to the Supreme Court out of the First Circuit, which was the Harvard University Affirmative Action. And, and, and Amy Chua out of Yale had written a book called The Triple Package, Why Some Cultural Groups Do Very Well in America and Some Don't. And so, you know, part of the numbers in that litigation was that in 1980, only 3% of Asians were at Harvard, and, and last year it was 20%. In the UC systems, there's all sorts of controversy about, do you cap the amount of successful Asians to maintain that? So were there conversations, or how do you address when some minority groups are still suffering, maybe in comparison to, to successes of others when you look at reparations? Maybe the remedy uh, might be economic-based rather than purely race. Um, that Harvard litigation, um, I mean, I could go at this a number of different ways. <clears throat> um, the, the Asian, when in the late 60s and, and early 70s, uh, when blacks uh, and black leaders were pushing for programs within the black community, um, one of the arguments that leaders, including President Reagan, had made was, um, you know, there are Asian Americans here and uh, they're doing good. 
they are really the model minority. Why can't you be like them? And <clears throat> the term model minority was born. Well, <clears throat> if you have a model minority, assuming that's true, and, and our community is not monolithic, and you in Houston and, and Texas and Austin uh, with large immigrant in populations of Asian Americans can see that this as well. Um, they're not all doing well. But secondly, if there is a model minority, that's a good minority. The corollary is there must be a bad minority. And that, what is that bad minority? Well, probably black and brown people. And so this, this hitting one group against another, I really resent, um, but that, that has happened and it's been to the detriment of, of, of groups all around. Um, I think the, the other piece of it is, is um, over half of the Asian American population here uh, immigrated here post-1965 uh, immigration reform. And immigration reform prior to 1965 was based upon uh, quotas, race-based quotas. And it was replaced by policies of family reunification and policies uh, of uh, skills-based. And so more than half of our population is post-1965. So they have no memory of, of the reason and the basis of 1965 immigration reform, which by the way, was made possible by the Black Civil Rights Movement. So from my perspective, at least as an Asian American, I think there is an obligation uh, owed to the black community. You know, I'm not saying that's uh, an obligation for the entire country, but certainly for Asian Americans, black leaders broke down those barriers and did so for women, for the disabled, uh, for uh, LBGTQ community and so on. That had it not been for that sacrifice that the black civil rights movement, I don't know that society would have changed. So I, I think there's an obligation there, but in, I think your, your ultimate question is, how do you divvy up scarce resources and opportunities? Uh, I would answer that in two ways. One, it can't be like it's what's happening now because uh, the spectrums of society between the, the haves and have nots is just widening. It is separating and accelerating to a much faster degree than ever. And, um, Secondly, um, again, uh, we ought not to, we, we cannot escape our past. I am firmly believe that the, the sins of the past do continue onward to infect the future. But I think there can be a way to do this um, in creative ways that uh, equitably spread those benefits. So a poor white person in, in Texas uh, deprived of opportunities uh, might also receive um, uh, uh, assistance and help just as, uh, you know, uh, poor kids coming out of black, black brown and, and Asian American communities. Uh, but I think it's totally a mistake uh, to, to uh, cut off those doors uh, now. So from a personal point of view, I was not for the plaintiffs in the Harvard uh, affirmative action uh, litigation. Mr. Tabaki, <clears throat> I don't, I'm not a fan in general of uh, slippery slope arguments, but this seems like an area of debate that is, it's rife with them. So I wanna, I wanna ask, um, both at a, at a kind of an abstract level, what you think about the legitimacy of those types of arguments, but also to put it into a particular context, what wrongs, how, how do you determine which wrongs have been committed in the, in the history of, of our country that are worthy of a societal effort towards reparation? Why this one versus that one? And, and how do you create a defensible line between those to say, yes, for, I think, you know, the case for Japanese Americans in turn during the war is, is a relatively clear one. I think 
there are a large segment of Americans who find the, the more dispersed uh, descendants of, of slavery arguments about reparations there to be less so. And you could continue going down and finding, uh, you know, ultimately non-compelling cases. Where do you draw the line on that? And, and in general, how do you address slippery slope arguments like that um, as they relate to claims for reparations like those? I, I think your point is well taken. There's always slippery slopes on this. And, and that's why everything is controversial in a matter of, of wrestling. But if we allow the status quo to continue as it is, that's a huge um, injustice and society is not, not the better for it. Um, I, I think, for example, um, economists, and historians, and psychologists, uh, if you were to follow the, the commission-based model of Japanese American reparations, could help uh, the country connect the dots between what happened during slavery, the failure of reconstruction, the imposition of Jim Crow, um, and a, a normalization. And when we talk about systemic racism, to me, we're talking about a culture of prejudice that normalizes uh, things that, um, to the point that people accept them as completely true. I, I, I think for Japanese Americans, it, it was, per, you know, uh, it, it, the incarceration was an incredibly popular thing. No one questioned it. You know, the fact that no crime of sabotage has been committed was disturbing indication that it will be committed. Nobody asked any questions about that. You know, what is the logic behind that? And um, why? Because it was normal for this group to be targeted. And um, until the George Floyd, um, I can't breathe, neck on, you know, knee on the neck thing had come out graphically almost nine minutes. Every time a black life is, is lost, it barely would evoke a shrug. Why? Because it's almost normal, you know? And so <clears throat> I, I think there has to be something that, that breaks up that normalcy. Now, it's one thing to draw attention to it. It's another thing to provide a remedy. And uh, there'll always be exceptions. And they'll always say, well, if you do it for this, you have to do it for this other thing. So what is the answer to do nothing? I, I really don't think so. I, I think not that the great society programs in the late 1960s were the answer, but people were able to go to college. They got law school. They went to, they got medical degrees. They uh, were able to break the cycle of poverty. And now, you know, uh, a bit, you know, years ago, I was tutoring kids at my high school and alumni in Oakland, California, and they had to hide their books so they wouldn't get beat up on the way home. And uh, uh, and then we say, well, you know, Brown versus Board of Education has ruled against uh, segregation, so therefore, you're on your own. The level, the playing field is level. And it is not level. Um, so <clears throat> some look at what remedial action can be taken, I think is really critical. And also, uh, I don't think um, even educated people know the, the depth of, uh, uh, of, of slavery and, and the impact of it. For instance, I'll, I'll bet most of you, when I talked about Korematsu versus the United States, you read of that in law school. But did you know the facts behind it and, and the drivers behind that? You probably didn't. The, the, the systemic racism was so pervasive and enduring that even the Solicitor General and the Attorney General of the United States um, crumbled when, when it came up to that pressure. And they had a choice of either disclosing and not lying to the Supreme Court or cover it up. And so, Ultimately, they, they decided to cover it up and was viewed as normal, fine. Uh, so <clears throat> I think those patterns um, have to be disrupted. I think those patterns um, have to be addressed. And 
I'm grateful, frankly, to the Black Lives Matter movement for um, drawing attention. On the surface, it's viewed um, as being prompted by police brutality. But underneath the surface, uh, I think it's much more. I think young people of all colors, uh, unlike the past civil rights movement, are raising deeper questions about a culture of prejudice that produces uh, bad outcomes. Can I ask a question? Do you think it would have been any, the ruling would have been any different if they had disclosed that evidence to the Supreme Court? I mean, you've got- Yes, I, got, I, I do. And we asked that question in ourselves, you know, suppose all the stuff had come out with the court decision have come out either way. And for example, um, in Justice Jackson's dissent, or maybe it's Justice Roberts, I can't remember one of them, had said, he asked the question in the dissent, how do we know that what General uh, DeWitt is saying is true? All we have before us is General DeWitt's self-serving report, untested by cross-examination. And he's already asking the question, you know, how do we know this is true? You know, the, the government tells us that these bad things are happening. How do we know that it's true? And uh, they concluded that, again, Roberts concludes that this is dangerous. This is a loaded weapon ready for the hand of any authority who can make a claim, a naked assertion unsupported by evidence, no trial. And so what was the loaded weapon? That without charges, without hearing, without trial, you could actually um, imprison an entire racial population, men, women, and children. Old That's adults. why I'm asking you the question. But you really think Hugo Black, who gave deference to everything FDR wanted, who hurts me, because he's one of my heroes on all the free speech stuff, hurts me that he was the author of this. But do you think it would have been any different if the argument had just been, well, it's possible that Japanese will go together and do X, Y, and Z. I just question whether or not kind of the, the foundation of the, uh, like the truth coming to light would have made a wit of difference. Yeah, because I, mean, I think the people on the Supreme Court are pretty smart. They were, they, they are. They kind of know that it, yeah. the jig was, anyway. Yeah, I mean, you're totally right. I mean, for example, the culture of racism, again, systemic racism, if I can use that word, um, made the rounding up overwhelmingly popular. The National Board of the American Civil Liberties Union had issued a directive to all of its chapters not to represent Japanese Americans. Ernest Bessig of the Northern California chapter defied that order and risked censure uh, for doing that. And um, it's possible that the culture racism would have been so strong that facts don't matter. The constitution doesn't matter. The law doesn't matter. And, and that's when democracy goes down the drain. And so how do we prevent that? Well, you shine a light on it for one thing. You don't sweep it under the rug. You don't say let bygones be bygones. It's important for people to know this stuff. And I feel the same about reparations that, that there is some, there are, there's a history behind it that we don't get better as a country until we examine that. And we certainly won't have peace as a country until we have accountability. Oh, uh, Mr. Tamaki, I um, was struck by a, a comment during the video that you played that um, among the drivers for uh, in, internment of Japanese Americans was a sort of state sanctioned theft of farmland belonging to those Japanese Americans. And I, I, I was struck by it because it's uh, among the things that, that you learn about the drivers for, for Jim Crow and even the practices of our own government to this day, if, you've, if, if you're familiar with the 1619 Project, which is the state sanctioned yeah. of land for black Americans. And um, I wonder is to what degree in the drive for reparations, did you get into those sorts of granular questions? Because I can imagine that there were some people, I mean, you said some people thought that $20,000 was way too little. And I am extremely sympathetic knowing that some of those people lost the capital on which they might have built, you know, great or small fortunes. Uh, and the question is compounded when you think about uh, 
you know, the growth that might have accrued to the earnings of what would eventually become Black Americans related to those who were enslaved. Like, how do you deal with those questions, which are the kind of thing that make reparations seem overwhelmingly inadequate in the sums in which we usually talk about them? I think the first goal was to at least get the public's attention that there's a compelling case here. And during the course of the commissions, of course, internees, people who, who are, you know, lost their farms, for instance, and their property uh, testified, but economists testified, historians testified. Uh, and they not only testified about the losses, but they testified about who benefited. And um, the uh, Japanese American roundup and incarcerated incarceration benefited a lot of people. Uh, like I said, Earl Warren, John J. McCloy, uh, and others who are architects really built their careers on vilifying this uh, population. And so um, if you analogize that to um, the Black community, and I don't think there has been enough information uh, out there and made available um, to the public about the economics of slavery uh, and, and the wealth that was created from that. And when we talk about that, I, I don't wanna just limit it to assets, land, uh, money, things like that. We're talking about opportunities. And then you combine that with the deprivation, deprivation of Jim Crow uh, that's, you know, went on through the, you know, the 60s and, and beyond. And, and one example of that is the absence of, uh, or the lack of, of, of black families having access to capital. It's called redlining. A lot of the post-war generation after the war was built on the ability to buy a house, to buy property, to start a business. Black communities were redlined out. Why? Because of a culture and tradition that stemmed back arguably from slavery. It was replaced because they couldn't have slaves anymore with a policy of supremacy. And that turned into a cultural culture and a tradition and a norm. Uh, to such a degree that the banking industry uh, continued that tradition. And when you cut people off from capital, just one thing, just the ability to get capital, uh, you automatically hamstring that community in terms of current and future generations. So um, it, it's more than just, you know, we think about these things about land or it's more than just dollars and gee, I lost my farm. It's a whole system. And I think um, commission hearings would help to fill in all those gaps because I don't think it's been, I don't think, it, I think there are terrific historians who know all about this, but it's not widely known even among educated people about the impact of prejudice, you know, what, what's happened in America. That ties in very nicely with my question. You talked in the beginning of your presentation about the rise of demagogues and alternative facts and conspiracy theories. And then you talked extensively about the role of education in getting reparations for Japanese Americans past. And in almost response to almost every question, you've highlighted the role of educating folks about the disparities that minorities face in our country. But just yesterday on MLK Day, um, Donald Trump published the 1776 commission report highlighting these alternative facts and theories about racism and slavery in our country. And I know you probably don't have the answer to this question, but any advice that you could provide this group on how to combat the hostility to education and to what actually has happened in Americans' history um, would be greatly appreciated. I think John Meacham, the historian, would say we've seen this before, whether it's the period of know nothings, this denialism of facts. If we look at other societies, pre war Germany and the rise of, of uh, Third Reich fascism in, in Germany, uh, in other dictatorial regimes, current and past, the commonality is this denial of facts where the someone can assert basically that the earth is flat 
and not round, despite overwhelmingly demonstra demonstrable evidence uh, of the contrary. And so <clears throat> people who know better, whether Republican or Democrat, um, conservative, liberal, uh, if we don't have a common set of facts, I'm, I'm telling you something you already know, if we don't have a common understanding of facts, th there is no future for democracy. D democracy can't exist without a, a common understanding of what facts are. Um, and the consequences when they're ignored, I mean, look at COVID. Um, in March, um, the president had said, we've got 15 cases and by next week, it's gonna be a miracle. It'll disappear and we will, we will reopen by Easter. And now because of Bob Woodward, we know in January that he was briefed on the potential threat that it was spreading in and here in America. And um, then it morphed into things like um, uh, beaming light into the body and injecting bleach and just this craziness that uh, scientists, again, whether they're Republican or Democrat are saying, no, there, there is science behind this. And now we're, you know, we're, we're at 400,000, it'll be 500,000 in the next two couple months. So the consequence of not having facts and believing in them uh, or politicizing them, put it that way, are huge. And so <clears throat> one of the reasons why it's such a privilege to me to talk to in of court is because anybody who takes an oath to support the constitution, uh, we need to pay attention to this. I, I think lawyers have a special responsibility to um, speak out uh, ab about some of the basics of this and, uh, and look to our education system, look to our media, look to the use of uh, social media platforms. Um, you know, there's no shortage of things we should be looking at. But I think what we're witnessing now is, is something historic, it's unprecedented. I, I realize, you know, demagoguery you know, in the early 1900s, 50,000 Ku Klux Klansmen uh, marched down, you know, Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, but we've never seen it at the level like this, uh, let alone an, an assault by thousands on the, on the Capitol in Washington, DC. So it really should be a wake up call for all of us. And uh, of course, part of it is just making ourselves aware. So, um, uh, you know, if you have contact with the legal, legal community, the judiciary, these conversations should be, should be going on in my view. And uh, uh, th that's the first step toward um, preserving, you know, what we've been taking for granted. I think democracies, as Judge Livingston has said, is very fragile. It's very, we, we think they'll last forever, but they actually come and go. Um, and it's incumbent upon us to to be mindful. Just want to step in and say this has been an amazing uh, discussion with Mr. Tamaki. And thanks to Judge Livingston for um, extending the invitation. Uh, I think uh, it's been a great discussion. And I'm not sure that we have any other questions that I've seen. So if there are none, we just wanna thank you so much for bringing this to us. Um, a lot of really good um, information, heartfelt presentation. I think it was a very uh, well received by our members. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Don. Thank you so much, Don. Thanks for hanging in. Take care, everybody. Thank y'all. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you again.